I'm Matt McClure and this is Currents. Free at last. The two remaining U.S. hikers in Iran are released. I'll talk with Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, who visited Iran just days ago to secure their freedom. Plus, is the A-bomb a thing of the past or a real danger in our future? We have at least 1,500 weapons pointed, ready to go at a moment's notice against the Russians, and they would have a similar amount of weapons pointed at us. And on the heels of the highly controversial execution of Troy Davis, we'll hear the story of a former prison warden's change of heart on the death penalty. Changing my mind about the death penalty came as a result of, of walking through the death penalty step by step. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. For many gathered at the UN's General Assembly today, it was difficult to sit still. Delegates from the U.S., France, and other European countries walked out during Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's speech. Ahmadinejad did nothing to discourage that, repeatedly condemning the U.S. and accusing countries of using the Holocaust as a, quote, excuse to pay ransom to Zionists. And just a couple of weeks after the anniversary of the September 11th attacks, Ahmadinejad accused the U.S. of using those attacks as an excuse to go to war. Who used the mysterious September 11th incident as a pretext to attack Afghanistan and Iraq, killing, injuring, and displacing millions in two countries with the ultimate goal of bringing into its domination the Middle East and its oil resources? Ahmadinejad's visit comes just a day after news of the long-awaited release of Josh Fatal and Shane Bauer, the two American hikers detained for two years after straying into Iran while hiking the unmarked Iran-Iraq border. Their release came just days after Washington's Cardinal Theodore McCarrick returned from Iran as part of a religious delegation hoping to secure the hikers' freedom. And I was actually able to speak by phone yesterday with Cardinal McCarrick following the latest news. Cardinal McCarrick, thanks so much for joining us today, sir. We really appreciate your time very much. I'm, I'm happy to be talking to you, Matt, always. Well, uh, one uh, thing I wanted to just ask, first of all, as we start out our conversation here, what is uh, your reaction to now the release of the hikers in Iran? Well, of course, we've been, it's been something that we've been praying for and working on for, for more than two years. So I'm, I'm delighted that it happened. As you, as you know, I was in Iran last week uh, working on this, and... Uh, it's a, it, we, we presumed it would happen, and, we've, and I, I presume it's going to happen today, but uh, you're never sure. And so I, I'm, I'm so pleased for them, so pleased for their families, and so pleased for, for the relations between our country and Iran, which have not been good for many reasons, and maybe this is a chance to improve them. Sure, and, and actually tell us a little bit, if you will, about... Um, the, the trip that you took, the meetings that you had. Um, how did you feel that, that the talks, what I understand, you actually met with uh, the Iranian president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad? Yes, yes, we did. We, I had met with him uh, a year ago when he was in New York, and even at that time we, we mentioned that the, uh, it looked as if there were, we weren't going to have uh, diplomatic channels between our two countries, and I said to him, I just hope that this doesn't mean that we won't have religious channels, that we won't be able to talk to the religious leaders on, on things that are of religious significance. And I mentioned the possible release of the, uh, of the two hikers. Uh, of, of, and we thanked them for letting Sarah uh, come back home. And we, we asked about the others. And at that time, he said, well, I, 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 want, you to come to, I want you to come to Iran. And that when I when I left him that that day, he said again. He said, "I look forward to seeing you in Iran." Mm -hmm. And so they, he invited us uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a bishop, uh, John Shane, the Episcopal Bishop of Washington, and myself, and two uh, Muslim Americans, uh, members of a uh, of a uh, of, of a Center for uh, American uh, Arab uh, interests. And so the four of us went over. We, uh, we were treated well. We weren't promised anything. Uh, 
we uh, at one time we thought, gee, maybe we'll they be able to come back with them. Uh, but then that didn't happen, and and then we thought, well, maybe at least we have a chance to see them. And that almost happened, but the last minute it didn't. And so we we came back uh, on Monday, uh, but I think with 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 great hope that they that everything was in place. And uh, from our conversations with President Ahmadinejad uh, last Saturday night, and with the foreign ministry and and with some of the religious leaders, it, it looked as if they they were ready to uh, uh, to uh, to negotiate uh, the the release of these two fellows. And you know, thanks be to God, they they were in there for two years, and we are so grateful to get them out. They're two young men, and they their lives are ahead of them. And I, I just pray that that they, those lives will be happier, uh, and that they will be able to to let this this terrible nightmare pass away. Sure. And, and you mentioned a moment ago the positive effect that this uh, could, could have on uh, U.S.-Iranian relations. Can you expand on that a little bit for us? What, what does this mean for relations between the two countries? Well, I, I think it, it, it indicates that, that, as we've always said, that a, if, if you have a religious channel, uh, it's, it, it certainly it, it can grow. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to have a diplomatic channel. It's great to be able to, to talk on that level. But at least if you have a religious channel, if you have a way in which men of, men of goodwill who, who believe together, believe in the one God, believe in, uh, in, in, in his goodness, in his compassion, in his mercy, since we all believe in that, I, I think that it gives us a platform to, to talk on. It gives us a, it, it, it builds a bridge. And I think when, if we can continue to build that bridge, uh, the president said to me Saturday, he said, you know, there really should be a, an ongoing committee of, uh, of religious leaders from the United States and Iran that meet together and that talk together. And I think that's, that's very worthwhile, and I, I hope that will be a possibility because it's, uh, it, it opens doors and it, and it makes understanding possible. And, you know, understanding is the, is the, is the basics basic uh, uh, factor that, that has to be present in, in cooperation. So uh, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a good sign all around. I'm sorry it took so long. I'm sorry. I, I feel so sorry for the, their families that suffered so much and for the two youngsters themselves. But, but now that's over. And with God's help, maybe there's a, there's a, new, a new day and may their lives be happy. And, and may what happened uh, be be seen in the context of, uh, of ultimately a, a, a new possibility of getting together uh, on, on, in other ways for our nation and Iran. Sure. Well, yes, hopefully things will, will definitely continue to improve. Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, uh, the Archbishop Emeritus of Washington, we thank you so much, sir, for taking some time out to join us today and talk about this very important issue and, and luckily the, this, this great outcome for these hikers. Really appreciate it. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Always great to uh, speak with Cardinal McCarrick. Really appreciate him joining us. Well, stay tuned. There is much more currents ahead. The Palestinian president will apparently press ahead for statehood at the U.N. That story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, the pleas of many, including the Pope, fall on deaf ears as a high-profile execution goes ahead as planned. We'll have that story, but first we'll have a look at the rest of the day's headlines. Well, despite requests from President Obama, it looks like Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas will formally request statehood recognition from the United Nations. A Palestinian official says that request will come in a letter to the UN Security Council on Friday. In his address to the U.N. General Assembly yesterday, Obama said he was in favor of a Palestinian state, but he said that that should come through negotiations with Israel. The Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem and the, and the organization Caritas Jerusalem have come out in favor of Palestine's request. Elsewhere in Washington, U.S. Bishops' Conference President Archbishop Timothy Dolan says the administration's refusal to defend the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, threatens marriage and church-state relations. DOMA defines marriage on the federal level as between one man and one woman. 
In a strongly worded letter to President Obama, Archbishop Dolan says that it is, quote, especially wrong to equate opposition to redefining marriage with racial discrimination. That's something he accuses the Obama administration of doing. Well, a year after the controversy first caught the public's attention, the Islamic Center, located two blocks from Ground Zero, opened its doors last night. Park 51 held its grand opening with a photo exhibit of New York children of different ethnicities. The center has drawn fierce opposition from people who say it should not be located so close to the site of the September 11th attacks. In an interview before yesterday's opening, the center's developer says the biggest mistake was not including 9-11 families in the project from the start. The center's advisory board now includes at least one 9-11 family member. Well, meanwhile, the Pope is on the go. Benedict arrived today in his home country of Germany for an official state visit. German President Christian Wolff and its Chancellor Angela Merkel greeted the Pope, the Pope at Berlin's airport. Benedict later traveled to the residence of the President, where he explained the trip's purpose. We as other statesmen are doing to do certain political or economic goals, to follow, but to meet people and to talk to them about God. Well, Benedict also addressed the German parliament, challenging its members to recognize what is just. About 100 members of parliament boycotted the speech. During the Pope's address, their seats were filled by former parliamentarians. The Pope told reporters that those who oppose his visit have a right to protest as long as they're peaceful. He also asked those who are leaving the church because of scandal to stay to help fight the problem from within. Pire, che in vista di tali informazioni soprattutto se sono vicini a persone proprie uno dice questo non è mio, più una mia chiesa la chiesa era per me forza della umanizzazione della moralizzazione se rappresentanti della chiesa fanno il contrario non posso più vivere con questa chiesa io direi sarebbe importante conoscere essere in chiesa non è essere in qualche associazione ma essere nella rete del Signore nella quale tira pesci buoni e mali. Benedict will be in Germany through Sunday. The United Kingdom has announced it will offer compensation to the families of those killed in the January 1972 Bloody Sunday Massacre in Northern Ireland. Thirteen people were killed and 14 others were wounded when British paratroopers opened fire on Catholics protesting the detention of Irish Republican Army suspects. Last year, Prime Minister David Cameron apologized after an investigation revealed the soldiers fired without justification. It's not clear just yet how much the government will offer the victims' families. Well, back in this country, a group of 34 people is suing the Diocese of Helena, Montana over sex abuse allegations by priests from the late 1940s through the 1970s. The group is demanding compensation, the publishing of names of sexual abusers, and the formation of a task force to tackle abuse. A diocesan spokeswoman says most of the priests and religious named in the suit were members of religious orders and not part of the diocese. Well, from France, two members of the group Opus Dei are accused of forcing a person to work for more than 10 years with little or no pay. The plaintiff says she first came into contact with the group when she was 14 years old and was gradually put under its control. She says she was placed on medication and encouraged to keep away from her parents. An Opus Dei spokeswoman, though, says the plaintiff chose to follow the group. In the meantime, a Muslim woman has become the first person to be fined under France's law that bans burqas. The woman received a $162 fine for wearing a full face covering in public. She told CNN why she chose to violate the law. For me, this is the beginning of the process to launch an appeal and get the attention of the European Court of Human Rights to attack the French state. I need to have this fine so that I can undertake the necessary appeal process. A second woman has also been fined for violating that ban. Well, back in this country, Archbishop Fulton Sheen could be seeing, uh, could be moving a step closer to sainthood, rather, that following news out of Peoria, Illinois, that might qualify as a miracle. A mother says she prayed continuously to Sheen after her son was stillborn and without a pulse for the first 61 minutes of his life. Only when doctors were ready to call the time of death did the boy begin breathing. Last week, uh, he celebrated his first birthday. 
If the miracle were able to be authenticated, it would be the first attributed to Archbishop Sheen's intercession. Two miracles are needed for a person to be declared a saint. Well, stay with us. There's more currents ahead. Coming up, as the United Nations celebrated World Peace Day, local Catholics examined an age-old threat to peace. American Catholics and Catholics around the world, really, they need to have this information to sort of form their spiritual life from. It's, it's, not, it's not a secular issue. Welcome back. With all the walkouts, the threats of vetoes, and geopolitical wrangling happening at the United Nations, you might be surprised to learn that yesterday was actually UN's World Peace Day. Yeah, it's ironically described as an opportunity for, quote, individuals, organizations, and nations to create practical acts of peace. Hmm. Well, the goal of peace not only figures prominently in the mission and work of the group Pax Christi, the very word peace is in its very name. Pax, P-A-X. And uh, only days before the countries convened at the United Nations would pay tribute to peace, the members of Pax Christi gathered to reflect on a threat to peace that, while dangerous, may very well be forgotten. We're here partially because we are doing this in honor of the UN International Day of Peace and to educate people against nuclear weapons and to activate people to work against nuclear weapons. Now, the speaker is Bud Ryan, who is the filmmaker. The topic is nuclear weapons, and really ultimately the abolition of nuclear weapons, being presented through Bud's film, The Forgotten Bomb. It's a huge story, you know, so somebody might know something that affects them in their hometown, and that would be the extent of their knowledge. So hopefully our film you know, enlightens people about the bigger picture of nuclear weapons. He visited Japan with his wife, who is Japanese, uh, about 20 years ago, and was just so moved by his experience of visiting Hiroshima, the Peace Museum there, that he decided that this was something that he really wanted to pursue further, to learn more about and to share with others. A lot of people would consider this film anti-American. You know, where we're just trying to tell the truth about what happened. You know, I didn't create this situation, you didn't create this situation, you know, and I, I would say the evidence is quite strong that uh, it never had to happen. Most people think since the end of the Cold War that us and the Russians have taken our weapons off of alert status, which is not the tr fact. We have at least 1,500 weapons pointed, ready to go at a moment's notice against the Russians, and they would have a similar amount of weapons pointed at us. We need to spread the word, talk to our friends, talk to our neighbors, talk to our colleagues, talk to our family, just spread the word, as well as be knowledgeable enough to be able to advocate with politicians you know, this is a Catholic group. We're not just a general public group. And that, for instance, I think we should show this film in, in parishes so that more Catholics understand it. Do you know? I mean, the popes have called consistently since World War II for peace. Paul VI stood up before the UN and said, no more war. So American Catholics and Catholics around the world, really, they need to have this information to sort of form their spiritual life from. It's, it's not... It's not a secular issue. Many of the peacemakers thought that, you know, an idea such as peace was much more powerful than any kind of weapon. So, yes, I definitely think peace is stronger. Just the concept is stronger than these weapons. All we have to do is look at the gospel to know that one of the phrases that Jesus used the most was peace to you, peace be to you, as well as be not afraid. And the two go very much together. So it really is fundamental to our faith and again we just need to cultivate that in others to recognize how fundamental it is. Stay with us there's more currents coming up. When we return a chance occasion becomes a change of heart on capital punishment for a former prison warden. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's exactly how I was raised. I realized one day uh, that I could no longer support the death penalty.
Nashville finally tonight in what may not be the finale of a high profile murder case. The execution of Georgia death row inmate Troy Davis went ahead last night after the Supreme Court refused to grant a stay. Davis was found guilty in the 1989 killing of off duty police officer Mark McPhail. Davis's, uh, Davis's uh, story rather drew a lot of attention with advocates claiming that he was convicted on shaky evidence. As for Davis himself, well, he told the victim's family that he did not kill Officer McPhail and he did not own a gun at the time of the murder, he said. Despite calls for clemency and after a more than three hour delay last night, Davis was put to death. Basically, it went very quietly. The McPhail family and friends sat in the first row. The warden read the order, asked if Troy Davis had anything to say and Davis lifted his head up, looked at that first row and made a statement in which he said he wanted to talk to the McPhail family and said that despite the situation you're in, he was not the one who did it. He said that he was not personally responsible for what happened that night, that he did not have a gun. He said to the family that he was sorry for their loss, but also said that he did not take their son, father, brother. He said to them to dig deeper into this case to find out the truth, he asked his family and his family and friends to keep praying, to keep working and keep the faith. And then he said to the prison staff, the ones he said who are going to take my life, he said to them, may God have mercy on your souls. And his last words were to them, may God bless your souls. And then he put his head back down. The procedure began and about 15 minutes later it was over. Well, Davis's story may not only force people to look more closely at, at his case in particular, but it also might have them rethinking their views on the death penalty itself. And one man who had a change of heart on corporal punishment was himself a former prison warden. Last year, we caught up with him at St. Augustine Parish here in Brooklyn, where he shared his story. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's exactly how I was raised. I grew into my adolescence, into adulthood, knowing that if you killed somebody else, that it was okay for you to be killed. Changing my mind about the death penalty came as a result of, of walking through the death penalty step by step, uh, getting to know uh, prisoners that I was about to kill, uh, having these people come and sit on the edge of my bed uh, after I had killed them. Uh, dealing with my own mental anguish, uh, finding my faith once again, uh, coming to the church, and, and, and glorifying my life with the fact that I realized one day uh, that I could no longer support the death penalty. The church today here in the U United States has come out and spoken uh, very strongly against the death penalty. So um, the feeling is that whether or not a person is guilty, or uh, life is more important than someone's guilt. I put 22,000 volts and 14 amps through this man's body, through his brain. I had to go to a burning airplane one time where a number of my comrades died in a plane crash, and it was a very smelly and horrible situation. But it was nothing like being trapped in that room, burning a live human being to death. People who, who commit a heinous crime, they certainly must uh, uh, be removed from society if they're dangerous. Uh, they must go to prison. And I cannot think uh, of a more appropriate way to handle the situation than to sentence these people instead of death, to sentence them to life in prison. Why so many people support the death penalty? I think there are many reasons, but uh, one of the main reasons is a misunderstanding that somehow the death penalty is a deterrent. It is not a deterrent. In fact, where there is the death penalty, there is a higher rate of crime. I had three people come up. One was a police officer, one was a police cadet, and the other was a correctional academy person. And they told me that they had never before realized uh, how little they knew about the death penalty and that each one shared with me that they could never support it again. Americans have an enormous amount of power in terms of making the wheel squeak with our political uh, process. Uh, 
calling politicians, uh, writing to politicians, approaching them personally, and letting them know that the death penalty is something that doesn't belong in a civilized society. Go to a meeting where there's a political leader present, making a speech, stand up and say, I have a question. And that question should be about the death penalty. Why do you support the death penalty? Do you just support the death penalty simply because you think that we'll vote for you? Or do you support the death penalty because you really believe in it? Very powerful story of a change of heart. Well, that is it for this edition of Currents. Don't go anywhere, though. There's more great programming straight ahead here on NET. No, it's not Sherlock Holmes, it's not Columbo, and it's not Murder, she wrote. It is a new season of Mysteries of the Church. Join host Carolyn Morrison as she uncovers the mysteries of the Catholic faith. Tune in tonight beginning at 8 with back-to-back -back episodes of Mysteries of the Church. Well, for all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.